Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Baker Institute. Um, hello, my name is Kirsten Matthews. I'm the fellow and researcher at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. I'm the director of the Science and Technology Policy Program, and I also work in the Center for Health and Biosciences and lead the Biomedical Research Policy Program as well. Welcome to today's event titled Stem Cell Therapies, Hype, Hope, and Evidence-Based Decisions. Today's event is a collaboration between Baker Institute Center for Health and Biosciences and the Texas Heart Institute in the Texas Medical Center. It's a part of an annual lecture series funded by the George and Mary Josephine Hammond Foundation. This is actually our seventh lecture in the series that was created in 2016 in honor of Dr. Willerson a little bit. He helped us with the first few years of this as well. And we're discussing the impact and importance of stem cell and regenerative medicine, specifically highlighting research and accomplishment of Texas and Texas researchers. In addition, we discuss ethical and policy challenges, including policy impediments to getting new therapies and the risk, of a, the risk that's associated with unproven uses of stem cells for, treating, uh, for treatments and their impact on clinical research. You will see there's a lot of advertisements for quick fixes for medical products, pills which may be cure cancer, they say, oils which could alleviate Parkinson's, Others promote the use of stem cells for different diseases and conditions that range from AIDS to Alzheimer's with little or even no evidence that they are effective or even safe. Today's event is going to focus on specifically clinical data and evidence. We're going to talk about what clinicians do to obtain it, why they do it, how they determine whether or not interventions work, and why this is such an important part of our clinical research portfolio. Before I start, I would really like to thank the Baker Institute staff that helped with this event, especially Serena Storm, Caitlin May, and Jordan Trailer for their support organizing the event, as well as I have to thank my collaborator at Texas Heart Institute, Carrie Sprung, without which this series wouldn't happen at all. So the next I need to do is to introduce somebody uh, which I think is quite distinguished, Dr. Joseph Rogers. He is the president and chief executive officer at Texas Heart Institute. He's a cardiologist, which you probably can guess from where he works at, and an internationally recognized and widely published thought leader in heart failure, transplantation, and mechanical assisted circulation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rogers. Well, good morning, everyone. And Kirsten, thank you for that kind invitation, or the kind invitation to speak, but the kind introduction. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. I think this is a wonderful and timely symposium. For those of you who uh, are acquainted with the field of stem cells and stem cell biology and the hype of stem cells, this is very timely. I think for those of us who practice medicine, it's not uncommon for people to come and sit down in the office and say, I know I want stem cells. But the real question is the evidence actually keeping up with the hype of what the promise that might be delivered by stem cells. And so I think today what we're going to try to do is to take a deep dive and try to understand how we generate a body of evidence that supports this novel and innovative therapy. And then we're going to hear from um, the regulatory agency that's thinking about how we're ensuring safety and efficacy in this space. Our first speaker today is one of my uh, old dear friends from Duke University, Dr. Adrian Hernandez. Dr. Hernandez is the executive director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute, the largest academic research organization in the world. He's a vice dean at the uh, Duke School of Medicine. And Dr. Hernandez is also a specialist in advanced heart failure, transplantation, and mechanical circulatory support. But Dr. Hernandez has spent a large part of his career involved in designing clinical trials from inception to publication of the results and secondary analysis. In fact, Dr. Hernandez has published more than 700 papers in the peer-reviewed literature. He's a widely held international thought leader in, in proactively and prospectively thinking about clinical trials and how they can be operationalized to be more efficient and more cost-effective. 
He's been very innovative in thinking about novel endpoints for clinical trials. And one of the things I appreciate um, about Dr. Hernandez's career is his passion for integrating the patient voice into clinical research. I think you'll enjoy hearing his comments. And Adrian, I'd invite you to the stage. All right. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Joe, for a, a great introduction. And so, uh, so this has uh, been really uh, fun for me to come back to, to Houston. And uh, actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some perspectives from, from that point of view here shortly. But what I want to share with you just over the next uh, few minutes is just this idea of um, how important it is to include uh, randomization in our Evans generation for <clears throat> what we're doing next. There's going to be all sorts of things that come up where it seems very logical uh, what someone does, what someone is testing, and the signals that they see. Um, but what may be unclear is uh, the total benefits to risk. And so it's really critical that we uh, use uh, this thing called randomization as a, a gift that keeps giving because it's going to be really important for our patients to make sure that we know what the right answers are when they're in front of us and also for the populations that we're treating. Uh, here are my uh, disclosures. But um, more importantly, I have one other one. Um, so I'm an alum of Rice. And so this building wasn't here uh, when I um, graduated in 1993. And so how it was is uh, on, on the left. Um, I was careful about uh, picking out a picture that I could use here. Uh, so this, uh, when I shared with my father that I was coming uh, here, he was so proud that I was coming back to uh, the homeland of Texas and, uh, and sent me some pictures here. <clears throat> and then uh, also I was scanning through my yearbooks to see like what other pictures I could show. And so, but this is the one I could show. So, uh, and then I had a lot of fun uh, yesterday just kind of uh, walking around campus to see how much has changed. And it's just really incredible. And so you think about, you know, what is evolving in this area of the medical center with Rice, it's really incredible to see how people are tackling science, uh, issues around ethics and so forth, uh, and, and policies. So just briefly, want to kind of touch on the, the speed of science. It's really incredible. And in, in the last several years, I think people have seen what's really happened in terms of uh, developing uh, new therapies. Talk a little bit about uh, the so-called ideas around observations versus evidence. And then just uh, share a, a few cases where it was very clear to everyone this should work. And then surprisingly, when we looked and doing a randomized trial, it didn't quite work out as expected. And that led to two things. One, preventing something that um, goes on to do something that doesn't work for our large populations. And two, actually refined the technology, the device, the therapies, so we could actually get to something better. And then share a few thoughts on, on what's possible. So it's clear every day uh, that we're seeing just incredible discoveries. Uh, there are now international platforms that are actually driving this. There's um, platforms that are in the US as well as the UK, for example. And we're starting to see advances where you can start thinking about actually molecular surgery almost, uh, that we start discovering um, what are the, what's the genetic basis for a disease, and actually even think about you know, what can be done in terms of gene editing, uh, in vivo or ex vivo. And so there are so many different promising technologies that become the promise of understanding what's happening in terms of the, the pathophysiology and biology of uh, health. And um, to keep up with that speed of science is quite difficult. Uh, so if you think about just uh, how the literature grows and doubles every day, the estimates, it doubles um, uh, every couple of months, uh, depending on how you define it. And uh, we are now getting overwhelmed with uh, so many different areas that are generating knowledge across the spectrum of health and disease and science taking advantage of different technologies, different techniques, uh, and also combining data that we've never seen before. And also thinking about uh, the holistic person, not just the person with their health problems, but also how they're interacting with the environment and how that changes there. And uh, just you know, an example of this is just you know, how, you could, how can you really harness all this knowledge that's being generated 
and uh, how people are, and organizations are creating uh, tools and techniques uh, to create so-called the atlas of knowledge so that someone can actually combine information to really understand what's happening. It's funny just to see like, you know, walking past Fondren Library and thinking that that back then in 93 was so-called a foundation of knowledge. You went to a library, you did research uh, with books. How do you do that now with uh, computers and other technologies? However, um, there are challenges there and there's a risk. And so uh, any answers may not be the right answers. And so this is just an example where uh, for different reasons there may be uh, misunderstandings um, uh, and also uh, misuse of data and then that could actually uh, lead to false answers or misrepresentation of data. And so being able to pick out what's the right answers is also important uh, in this uh, incredible uh, growth of, of knowledge or, or science is being published. And then there's this other issue, um, observations, you know, what's real or imaginary. And I know we have people on Zoom, so I can't see how they would vote, but um, I'll just ask this question to this audience here. Uh, can you count? Just raise your hand. This is a really smart audience, I assume. Okay. Uh, well, uh, let me ask you this. Um, how many legs does this elephant have? And so, again, there's uh, perceptions that may uh, change what is really here. And so, uh, and then uh, this one um, may or may not work there, but if you stare at this, is this photo moving? And so I think this is an example, a simplistic kind of um, example of how observations may or may not be true. And so the question on the left is, does the elephant have four or five legs? Uh, depends on what you look at. So uh, in uh, clinical evidence generation, um, we've um, been burned in the past, um, where we think that you know, we want to get to an answer really quickly. Uh, we have a surrogate. It's a really defined target. Um, so we have an intervention. It uh, changes a biological system. We can measure a protein. It goes up you know, we, or go down, and uh, we know we win the game. In the field of cardiovascular uh, medicine, uh, that hasn't always played out, unfortunately. And so while this logic of something linear, um, having a disease, a surrogate, and a true clinical outcome may be related uh, with intervention, uh, that may or may not uh, work out. And there are a number of examples where uh, that model um, when actually put to the tr test in a randomized setting, uh, didn't work out. And so we can't always rely on surrogate endpoints. Uh, there may be other factors that come into play. The other thing is that we don't necessarily know the off-target effects. And so, for example, for small molecules, we may have some idea what pathway they may uh, uh, interact with. We don't know what pathways they also interact that weren't designed for that. And we don't really have great ways to measure that, and so it's that benefit-risk uh, ratio that matters. When you start thinking about cell therapy, it's not just like a small molecule. Uh, as you all know, it is a, a bag of molecules. And so what does that do in terms of interactions and the environment that it goes into? And also all the different methods that are used to deploy it. And so really understand that benefit-risk ratio is an example. I'm going to share a couple examples uh, here uh, where it's very logical. Uh, hypertension is a major public health problem. There are problems with uh, adherence with medications. Uh, there's a, a device uh, technology that focused on uh, renal denervation, so you could essentially buzz uh, the renal, uh, part of the renal nerves that would alter uh, the ability to uh, raise blood pressure. Um, and uh, you could show in a series of studies how effective that was. And, um, and the interesting thing is that they were fast moving on in terms of uh, using this device to get it eventually to prove. Well, and then what was asked is to do a randomized clinical trial with a sham procedure. So not just a randomized trial, but actually a, uh, with a sham procedure. And amazingly, um, it didn't work. Uh, all the other studies, including some randomized studies, showed uh, it worked or possibly worked. And, and you think about blood pressure, that's not something that, say, you typically would have under control. But this has been borne out with medical therapy as well, randomized trials where there's a placebo effect, that people's blood pressures go down as they're a part of the trial. Uh, the same thing happened in orthopedic surgery. Uh, so um, people have knee pain, you can do um, imaging or arthroscopic evaluation, you see a tear, a meniscus tear. 
uh, that's certainly rubbing the wrong way. But if you take care of that, um, will it um, uh, relieve the knee pain and allow people to function better? And very logical, uh, uh, technical successes, uh, but in, in one example, uh, doing a randomized trial showed that there was no benefit. And that is likely because the meniscus tear isn't the only problem. And so you target something and it may not be the whole problem that you have to address. Uh, and you know, I use this you know, so I can put ourselves out as cardiologists, so it's not just you know, uh, some other fields, but uh, there's a, a thing called the oculus donotic reflex, as we say, uh, that you see a blockage, uh, you can put a stent there, open it. Um, in, in acute MI settings, that actually works. Someone has a heart attack, um, it saves lives. In someone who has stable angina or chest pain, uh, it may not work. And so, uh, in, in this case, a famous trial called Orbita, uh, just opening the blood flow didn't actually help with exercise uh, capacity. And so again, opening our eyes in terms of uh, not all interventions can prove the outcomes that make sense. In this area of cell therapy, it's really incredible in terms of how things have blossomed. All the different range of possibilities of uh, new, uh, essentially, generations of therapies, then also the different uh, components that can go along. And so we're seeing just incredible advances and in not only kind of uh, uh, development of cell therapies, being able to um, do actually uh, trials in a petri dish, um, and also doing modifications to, to cells that may be more personalized to uh, people's health problems. And certainly in oncology, this has been uh, really incredible to see some of the advances uh, here. Uh, and so uh, if you think about these combinations, there is going to be this um, strong um, uh, risk where people can say this makes sense. Uh, and it does, but I think we owe it to our patients and to the uh, people we care of to prove it uh, through a randomized trial. And uh, if we don't have systems that do so, uh, we'll have what we call opportunity costs and the, from the thousand flowers of blooming. So if we just do one-off studies all the time that just show like doing an intervention, looking to see what happens without doing a randomized trial, uh, we may not actually learn. We may actually generate noise, but we may not actually learn. And this is an example uh, from COVID uh, where there are thousands of flowers, thousands of trials that were underpowered and didn't complete uh, and didn't generate the answers. But the 500,000 patients who participate in those who thought they were helping science and health did not get uh, an answer for society. Uh, uh, the vast majority of them participated in a system uh, that wasn't going to give them an answer. And so in this area, I think it's important to have that. So there are a number of considerations as we think about the future. Um, there's definitely been controversies in the past around cell therapy. Uh, just a quote from someone who's um, been part of this, uh, the sad plight of cell therapy for heart failure and uh, understanding the cause and the consequences. And there have been certainly a lot of missteps along the way um, early on because of the enthusiasm <clears throat> was um, outpacing uh, the Evans generation. And so uh, an area is complex because uh, mechanisms may not be known, it hasn't always worked, and things that are very logical or areas are illogical. And also because of incentive structures, um, we may have um, incentivized um, science um, that uh, may not uh, be as truthful as we want. And so uh, to get there though, like we do need to kind of progress in terms of, cause there is a lot of potential benefits that's been seen in um, a variety of stages uh, of development. And so we still have huge unmet needs uh, that we can address. So uh, in summary, just, you know, we are really in exciting times. Uh, if anything, the last several years have indeed shown, you know, where we are in terms of the science accelerating. We still have huge unmet health needs and it's for those reasons we really need to make sure we have a system that rigorously evaluates the benefits versus risk um, because we can't afford the opportunity cost to get it wrong. Uh, the COVID example that I shared that out of 500 or so thousand people and only 15,000 actually contributing to an answer is something that we can't have. So let's not guess, uh, let's randomize and have the gift that keeps giving. So with that, uh, thanks so much and we'll go to the next.
I have distinct recollections of <clears throat> being in debates against Dr. Hernandez, which were never any fun <laughs> for me. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Heather Lombardi, and Dr. Lombardi is the director of the Office of Cell Therapy and Human Tissues uh, within the Center of Biologics Evaluation and Research at the FDA. Dr. Lombardi is a trained structural biologist from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she is uh, published in peer-reviewed journals, uh, and in her role at the FDA is an important advocate for the use of appropriate science and risk-based oversight as a foundational element to successful pathways forward for technology. Um, the FDA has some very interesting um, charges. Uh, the FDA is designed to make sure that the, the therapies that are used in us every day are safe. Uh, and that they're effective, and that the risk-benefit of all of those therapies is in favor of benefit. I think you'll find her comments to be important and particularly relevant to this as she begins to help us explore the regulatory thinking around stem cell therapies. Heather, thanks for joining us. Hi, good morning. I'm very honored to be here today, and I am glad to be able to offer somewhat, I think, of a different perspective, not only the FDA perspective, but also I'm, um, as you can see, the director of the Office of Cellular Therapy and Human Tissue, which is a manufacturing office. So it's, it's more of sort of the manufacturing or the product side um, versus more sort of the clinical perspective you may be hearing from others. Um, I've been with FDA for about 15 years and previously worked in the Center for Veterinary Medicine um, and I worked on these very products um, for animals as well and that's something you know a lot of people don't think about but um, there is this whole field of research also going on for use in animals um, and have recently transitioned to the human side uh, at CBER where I've been since November of last year. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about FDA's oversight of HCTPs. Um, as you know, F uh, FDA and the government in general uses a lot of acronyms. Um, so you may hear me use several acronyms throughout the presentation, and I'll do my best to explain those. Um, so this is an outline of the talk. I'm going to define that acronym for you. I'm going to explain a little bit about our legal authority under which we regulate. I'm going to highlight briefly the regulatory review process for those products that go through the approval process. I'm going to describe briefly some of our recent court filings and regulatory actions on HCTPs, as well as efforts um, that the agency has um, contributed to consumer outreach. So what are HCTPs? So this is the long acronym. Human cells, tissues, or cellular or tissue-based products. They are articles containing or consisting of human cells or tissues that are intended for implantation, transplantation, infusion, or transfer to a human recipient. As you can imagine, this encompasses a wide variety of different types of products. Um, and I'll show you in the next slide a little more detail of what is considered an HCTP and what is not. Um, so some examples of these, as you can see here, various cells and tissues, uh, muscular skeletal tissue, cardiovascular tissue, dura mater, ocular tissue, reproductive cells and tissues, placenta, amnion, um, as well as I know you're probably familiar with a lot of the cellular therapy products, in including mesenchymal stem or stromal cells, um, pancreatic islets, and fibroblasts. And then there is also the hemopoietic progenitor cells derived from peripheral or umbilical cord blood. And that's where you may have noticed a lot of our approvals in, in that area. Um, some cells and tissues not considered in HCTP are uh, vascularized human organs for transplantation, blood and blood components. These are regulated in our uh, different series of regulations. Uh, human milk, human collagen, non-human cells, tissues, or organs, in vitro diagnostic products, uh, blood vessels covered with an, recovered with an organ that are intended for use in organ transplantation, minimally manipulated bone marrow for homologous use and not combined with another, another article, um, with rare exceptions, and then uh, vascular composite allografts. So switching gears to our legal authority, 
So um, FDA regulates HCTPs under two different acts. Um, there's the Public Health Service Act, which was uh, created in uh, the 90s, and this was in response to um, controlling for transmission of communicable disease with uh, cell and tissue products. Um, and so that is the primary goal of the, the PHS Act, is, is to really prevent that uh, transmission, disease transmission. Um, and then there's also, for some products, the are also subject to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And those are the products that are uh, going through the approval process, which I'll explain a little more. So uh, you may hear uh, FDA refer to 351 or 361 products, um, and that refers to the section under which they're regulated under the Public Health Service Act. So 351 of the PHS Act um, indicates that a license is needed to distribute an HCTP in interstate commerce. Uh, the product must be demonstrated to be safe, pure, and potent. And then it also gives uh, FDA the authority for suspension, revocation of power, and recall authority. Section 361 of the PHS Act um, authorizes FDA to in issue and enforce regulations necessary to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable disease from foreign countries into the U.S. or interstate. So it's broken down into two different tiers, and this is a risk-based structure. Um, so you have the 351 HCTPs, which are regulated under both 361 and 351 of the PHS Act, and also, um, in some cases, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And then you have the lower risk category, which are the 361 HCTPs, which meet the criteria to be kicked down into this lower tier. These products are regulated solely under the authority of 361, are subject to the tissue regulations in 21 CFR Part 1271, the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations. And this is the important distinction for the 361 HCTPs, is that pre-market review and approval is not required. So to be considered a 361 HCTP, the product must meet uh, these four criteria, which I'll, I'll outline for you. Um, so there's minimally manipulated. It must be minimally manipulated, meaning that the processing that occurs doesn't alter the basic um, properties of that HCTP. Um, and we actually have a guidance that explains this in greater detail and actually has some helpful examples of what FDA's um, interpretation of minimal manipulation means. Um, for example, um, you know, there's an example where, you know, bone is, is ground into a paste um, or where bone is dissolved um, with um, it being subject to acid. Um, and it, it really depends on how that material is acting after the processing. Um, so um, it's a little bit complex and can, can be difficult to understand at times, but we're always available to, to answer questions if, if people um, need help with that. Um, there's also the criteria for intended for homologous use only, um, meaning that the um, repair, re reconstruction, um, supplementation of a recipient cells with an HCTP um, that performs the same basic function in the recipient as it did in the donor. So, uh, for example, you know, adipose cells are really forming this sort of cushioning um, support function. Um, you know, it depends on how those are used in the recipient. If they're using that same basic function, that would be considered homologous use. Uh, they can't be combined with another article with some exceptions, and some of those exceptions are things like um, cryopreservation um, that don't really alter the, the basic characteristics of the cellar tissue. And then uh, lastly, it should not have a systemic effect and is not dependent upon the metabolic activity of living cells for its primary function. 
unless it's for autologous use, it's in a first or second degree blood relative, or for reproductive use. Okay, and this is a brief snapshot of the regulatory review process for 351 products. So these are those that are undergoing the approval process. Um, this is primarily to show how FDA works with developers early on, um, you know, even before those preclinical tests occur. Uh, we, we encourage developers to come in and to, you know, talk to us about their product and their product development. Um, this is where we, you know, work with developers and understand more about their product through product characterization studies. And this is primarily where, you know, the, the safety focus begins of ensuring safety of the product um, throughout its life cycle. As the product continues towards preclinical testing and then later into clinical trials. Sorry, do you have a question? Sure, absolutely, yep. So I mentioned the criteria before um, about what would be considered 361 or 351. So 351 would be something that wouldn't meet those criteria. You know, either the processing that's occurring, um, you know, it's being manipulated beyond just what we consider minimal manipulation. So something like, you know, you're isolating a mesenchymal stem cell from adipose tissue and you're using that for some sort of, um, you know, eye treatment or, um, you know, to help you with arthritis or disease indications. Um, anything that would be beyond those basic criteria that I outlined before. Does that help? Okay, great. Um, so the... Going back to what I was saying, and, and as I said before, I have more of a manufacturing background, um, so the focus of my group is to ensure that um, those sponsors who are developing these products are really thinking about the critical quality attributes of their product and designing tests um, and in process controls to build in the quality in their product. Um, and this is where we put this um, statement at the bottom of the, su the slide, safety and quality must be designed into the product. So it's not a matter of testing the end product and saying it meets all the tests, it's good. It's really about building in that quality throughout um, the processing of the product. Um, and these are things like potency tests, as I said, in process testing, there, there may be certain biomarkers that are important for the function of the product, but these are the things that the sponsor um, should really have a handle on based on those early product characterization studies that they performed. You can find these on our website. This is a list of the approved FDA cellular therapy products. Um, this does not include the cell-based gene therapy products. This is solely the cellular uh, therapy products. Um, as you can see here, um, there are many examples of cord blood derived products. Um, the two at the bottom, uh, Macy and Stratigraft, are examples of both a cellular product combined with a matrix, a collagen matrix, and for use for things like wound healing. Um, here are some recent examples of approvals. Um, Omi Surge, which is um, for use in adults and pediatric patients 12 years and older with hematologic malignancies who are planned for umbilical cord transplantation following myoblative of conditioning. To, and this product is used to reduce the time to neutrophil recovery and the incidence of infection. And then our most recent approval is Lantidra. Um, which are, you know, pancreatic islet cells that are used for the treatment of adults with type 1 diabetes who are unable to approach the target HbA1c. And you, as I said, you can find these on our website. If there's ever a question about whether FDA has approved a product, it will be listed on our website. Um, so switching gears a little bit to more of some of the enforcement challenges, um, this is an outdated pictorial, but as you can see here, hopefully you can see some of the differences in the color. 
Um, this shows the number of stem cell clinics per country. And as I said, this is from 2016, but there's been a rapid growth in the number of these clinics. Um, and as you can see, there's a high density of clinics in the United States. Um, I actually read, I think, a, a publication from Dr. Matthews that you know, cited um, even in Texas the increase in percentage of stem cell clinics grew 312% um, between, I think, 2017 and 2021. Um, so this is a rapidly growing area, and enforcement is always a challenge, and is definitely a challenge for FDA as well. Here are some recent examples where FDA uh, was able, excuse me, sought permanent injunction against two uh, stem cell clinics. One of these um, occurred in Florida, um, where adipose um, cells were, were being used and injected um, into an ocular treatment and ended up leaving some patients blind. Um, and then there's a recent case, um, California Stem Cell Treatment Center, um, where um, it, it's really about, you know, surgical transplantation of autologous cells and, you know, the question at hand is whether or not those cells can be considered a 361 HCTP. Um, the court initially um, made an initial judgment um, in that case that, um, you know, those cells um, in certain instances were considered 361 HCTPs, and it really put into question some of H, uh, the agency's interpretation of minimal manipulation. The agency has filed an appeal to this case, and that appeal is still pending. Um, in addition to injunctions, we also have other enforcement actions that we are able to take, and these are sort of listed um, in, in terms of degree, um, the, the, come, the come to our attention letters are sort of have the less um, enforcement teeth to them. It's more of an early communication to send out to um, developers or clinics and to gather additional information, you know, about what they're doing and to provide them information about the regulations for which they may be subject to. An untitled letter is a little bit stronger. Um, it's an initial correspondence with regulated industry that cites violations that don't meet the threshold of regulatory significance for a warning letter. And then lastly, warning letters are informal advisory correspondences that are issued to achieve voluntary compliance to establish prior notice. And you can find more information about that on our website. Um, FDA has, has taken a lot of efforts in uh, consumer outreach so that the public understands, you know, the risks associated with the use of stem cells, especially, you know, stem cells that maybe aren't under regulatory oversight. Um, one of these is the clinicaltrials.gov website where it lists um, those HCTPs which have an IND are under FDA oversight. However, there, as you can see, there is a disclaimer on this website um, just to notify the public that just because it's listed on this list, it doesn't mean that FDA has shown that this HCTP is safe and effective um, and there has been no approval of this particular product. So if you hear otherwise, um, just know that, that that's not true. Sometimes um, companies get a little confused and they think when they have an IND, that's, or they may use the word approval, um, and that's not the case. There's also been some recent outreach related to the use of regenerative medicine, including stem cells and exosomes. Um, exosomes are, are, are fairly new category of products, um, and some of the same sort of disease prevention claims or disease treatment claims have been used, um, and FDA is warning the public about these. 
Um, just to note, no exosome products have been approved by the FDA. Did you have a question? Yeah, so I think, you know, as I was saying before, the primary difference between 361 and 351 is related to that pre-market approval process. There are still obligations for 361 products, including things like donor eligibility testing, um, adherence to good tissue practices, um, but the, the regulatory process is quite different for those two products. In terms of you know, what differentiates the 361 versus the 351. You mentioned beauty products. I wish it was that simple, it's not. Um, but you know, it has to do with, like I said, the manipulation of the products. Also, any, you know, claims that a, a sponsor could be making, you know, if they're adding a disease claim, um, then that would not be considered a 361 product. Um, I'd also like to say that I know this is very confusing, um, FDA does have a process if you have questions whether or not a product is a 361 or 351. There's a, uh, this TRG, um, which is this uh, tissue recognition group where you can submit your questions and um, you will receive a response from FDA based on the information provided whether or not FDA agrees that it's a 361 or 351 product. Um, Sorry, tissue reference group, I said that wrong. Um, so please, if you have questions, get in touch with me. I can point you to that resource. Yes. Sure, so the stem cell is like the, the cell, the whole cell, and the exosome is like, uh, I'm trying to explain this non-scientifically. Uh, <laughs> Uh, pinching off from the cell that may include, um, you know, nucleic acid or other cellular components, but it's not the whole cell. Okay, and this is just a slide with a little bit of resources for you. Um, we have many different guidance documents on these topics. Um, we have a, a website on the types of enforcement actions FDA can take. We have a webinar for practitioners. Um, so many different resources in addition to what's shown here. And then lastly, my contact information. Um, the one thing I try to drive home when I do these presentations is we are here as a resource. Um, we want to help you and we want to help you understand um, you know, FDA's oversight. So if there are ever any questions, you know, whether it be from a sponsor or you know, just the general public, um, you know, we want to help clarify it for you. So um, I list my contact information here, and I'm always open to any questions you may have. So <clears throat> thanks to both of you for really wonderful talks. I think you've set the stage for a good conversation. This, this seminar series has been very intentional about having short introductions to complex topics, but then leaving us plenty of time to discuss. And it's clear already from the questions coming from the audience that they've raised a number of important issues that this group needs to talk about. I think we need to be mindful of the audience a little bit. Uh, for sure, so, that we're, and so if we say something during this discussion and you want clarification, please don't hesitate to pause and just ask us to clarify something. Two other just brief introductory comments. Um, we have an electronic system so that you can submit questions if you don't care to raise your hand. You can scan the QR code um, on, the, on your tables and then electronically submit through a smartphone. And if you need help with that, 
Carrie Sprung, just raise your hand, Carrie Sprung will come around and help you uh, so that you can ask your question. The other thing I wanted to do is just introduce Dr. Emerson Perrin, who's come into the audience. And Dr. Perrin is a colleague of mine at the Texas Heart Institute and has spoken at this symposium in the past, but has <clears throat> played an important role in the evolution of stem cell therapies for heart disease, in fact, was the first uh, cardiologist to inject stem cells into a human being to treat heart failure. And so I think Emerson comes with a really interesting perspective on much of what you've just heard today is an experienced clinical trialist has designed clinical trials for stem cell therapies. And I'd like to engage with you, Dr. Perrin, as well as we continue this discussion and try to learn more about stem cell therapy uh, in the management of a variety of different human illnesses. We already have one question, and this was, <clears throat> this was a question, Heather, that um, I had thought about and had written down, but someone has submitted this question. FDA has a mandate to ensure medical interventions are safe and, and, and efficacious, but they're also mandated to bring these interventions quickly to market. So how challenging is it to fulfill these two sometimes competing mandates? Should we speed up the process, and how can the process be sped? Yeah, that is a very complex question, <laughs> um, and it's definitely something that I struggle with almost on a daily basis. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, the answer is, is also very complex. <clears throat> I think it has to be addressed in, in multiple ways. Um, I, I do understand the great need to get these promising and safe and effective therapies out to patients, you know, in an efficient process. Um, you know, I, I mentioned some of this in my talk about working early on with sponsors. I do think that that is beneficial um, to start at those early stages, you know, primarily from a manufacturing standpoint. There are so many things about these types of products that are very complex and, and hard to understand, including, as mentioned before, mechanism of action, um, you know, development of things like potency assays to, you know, make sure that the product is doing what it's supposed to do in the, in the patient and for having a quantitative measure um, to look at something like that and to make sure that every lot of that product that is being manufacturing is of sufficient quality to give you that clinical effect that was observed in the clinical trials. That is extremely challenging. And so I think a lot of those issues have to be discussed early on and planned for. In addition, also from a manufacturing perspective, lots of changes occur throughout the process. And just anticipating those changes and how to address those from a regulatory perspective, I think it really helps to have those early conversations um, the other piece of it, uh, you know, we have implemented several programs, um, like the RMAT program, Breakthrough Designation, and these are programs for these life-saving sa regenerative medicine therapies to hopefully get them to market, um, you know, in an expedited time frame. Um, I think those programs absolutely help. Um, you know, I, I also think there has to be regulatory flexibility where we can. Um, obviously, we have constraints under the um, laws and regulations that we work under. Um, as you mentioned, there has to be a demonstration that the product is safe and effective, and there's no getting around that. But are there ways we can be flexible? You know, if an issue comes up, it's a, somewhat of a challenge from a regulatory perspective you know, creatively thinking of ways we, where we can overcome those. And I think that has to be a conversation both between FDA and sponsors, um, you know, working together on some of these issues. But one uh, comment I'll just <coughs> add, Joe, because you know, actually, in general, it's, um, it's uh, easy also to kind of point a finger to FDA and say, solve this. Um, however, uh, we've all contributed to the, what we call, uh, what I call the Gordian knot of uh, evidence generation and clinical trials. So if you were asked the question, where um, are the first gene editing therapies often done, as an example, or something that's a first new medical technology? It's often done outside the US. Uh, new Zealand is an example. And why is that the case? Well, certainly um, it, it may be because of kind of 
different uh, views or kind of processes from a regulatory perspective, but also the system's easier. So uh, in terms of getting the uh, administrative approvals for contracts or RBs, the things that you may not necessarily think about, and I say in the US, the healthcare systems, we, me, um, we've added to, I'll just say, bureaucracy in a way that doesn't simplify things as a holistic system. So just like healthcare is fractured, you know, so is the research system, and we've all contributed to it. So, uh, so certainly the FDA can help um, to um, uh, speed things up, but we'll also have to help on, on the other parts of the, the system. So, so I think that there, are, for all of us as consumers of healthcare, there's always a question about, about the length of time it takes to get a product to, from, from clinical trial, from, from early phase clinical trial to market. And then the product comes out, it's seemingly inordinately expensive in, in many cases. I wonder if, if you might give us some examples of sort of what, what does that time frame look like, just so that we're all, we all understand from the first time someone comes to you with an idea until there's an approval, do you have a sense for these biologics, what that, what that time horizon looks like? It might help us understand why once the product finally comes to market, they're so incredibly expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't give a defined time frame, but I can say um, you know, sometimes it takes many, many years, um, even in those initial stages, to really understand what a product is and what it does, to think about things like scale up of manufacturing, um, you know, GMPs. Um, this can take several years, and these things are not cheap. Manufacturing is not cheap. Um, and, and, you know, quite a bit of investment from these companies go into, you know, providing resources in these areas. Um, you know, and the regulatory process itself, um, I, I realize, you know, that is, is somewhat of a cost as well. Um, so, you know, it does take time to get through the process. And, you know, it's also challenging because a lot of the companies in this space are new or um, not as experienced as like some of the bigger pharma companies and they don't understand the regulatory process as well and that is where I think we play a key role into educating them and to helping them through the process. So I didn't really answer your question but hopefully that provides no, some I perspective. No, I think it, it, it does. <clears throat> Adrian, I mean you, you've done an awful lot of pharmaceutical trials. What's your perspective on this sort of time horizon? Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, it's over a decade. And if you think about like, say like a concept, say like that eureka moment that someone's discovered something in a lab saying like, hey, this is like possible. Um, how that's taken forward in terms of actually developing into a potential um, a medical product or a biologic and actually thinking about different versions of that and going through that step of the process and doing the preclinical work that's necessary to understand at least uh, you know, what are the potential um, uh, effects of that um, and doing under, understanding, say, are there any potential um, side effects there? And so, for example, in, uh, in heart disease, uh, one of the worries around cell therapy is like, okay, when you ultimately inject into heart, will you cause arrhythmias? Uh, and so, like, that's not something you necessarily can always tell in, say, the um, Petri dish. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to do some things uh, early on. And so that process, you know, uh, the preclinical work in terms of developing, refining it, uh, does take several years. And then uh, the later stages also take several years. And certainly all those things can be optimized because now there's technologies that can um, do essentially trials in the dish, so to speak, to have a better understanding of what may be happening before you put it into uh, uh, an animal model or a, a early human studies. And so that could be helpful. And then, you know, changing the, the ecosystem so uh, we go faster when they get ready to go to clinical. So, yes, please.
And if I might, just because we're streaming this, so I'm gonna just repeat the question so that the people who are watching online can hear. So the, the question was, there's some difference between regulatory bodies in the speed with which trials get up and running. What's the difference between, for example, working through FDA versus working through the European Union and, and getting CE mark um, approval? Uh, I have an opinion, and so I'll just say that um, <laughs> I, th I th one of the things that people may not necessarily realize is actually um, the world actually depends on the FDA in terms of their rigor analysis. Uh, they, uh, they do a lot of um, uh, independent analyses of the, the results that are being generated. So that should, that's part of it. Uh, the uh, other thing is in, in certain parts of the world, there may be um, more focus in terms of uh, certain areas and so they become known for that and say like for medical technologies uh, now if you were to ask me um, say uh, something comes to my mother here in the US I pretty much want to make sure that like it's past the rigor of the FDA uh, before offering it uh, to my mother that's my opinion but uh, thank you, you yeah and uh, you know as I said I was explaining the laws and the regulations that we work under, different countries have different applicable laws and regulations. Um, and I think, um, you know, as was said, the, the standard is high. Um, it's considered to be the gold standard. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, in my experience, I've seen where companies often try to get the FDA approval first and then subsequent other approvals um, because it is something that is very distinguished um, amongst the public. Dr. Perrin. Yeah, to answer your question, um, I have experience doing trials both in Europe and here in the US, and that used to be true. So it used to be easier to get an approval in Europe than in the United States. And actually there are shelf therapies that are approved, like for example in Spain, for certain very specific things. But that's changed. And actually the EMA and the European agencies have now changed their, their focus to emulate the FDA, which is a gold standard of, of rigor. And so actually in working with companies now in the UK and other places, the, the, the bar is about the same now in Europe as it is in the United States. So there's been a, a equalization of the uh, difficulty, if you'll have, uh, or, or which is a, a good thing of uh, getting things approved on both sides of the pond. Yeah, the, t the timelines, on the, and I, I can answer that prior question. <laughs> I'll give you an example of cell therapy in the heart. We're looking at, and this is, I, the, the story isn't over yet, but I will say at least 25 years. So they're talking about, a no, it's not a decade. Uh, in 2001, we injected, we did the first randomized trial. We've been working on this. We now need to do a confirmatory trial, and that's gonna be several more years, assuming we get an approval. So 2001 to 2025, 26, that's the kind of timeline we're looking at. Um, and I'll just make another comment. One thing that is just so, I, I wish we had more funding uh, because the FDA does really uh, uh, hold everyone, as it should, to very high standards. We gotta prove things scientifically, and that means reproducibly showing things that are truths <laughs> and that is evidence. And, uh, and unfortunately, we have over 3,000 clinics, what I would call Mickey Mouse clinics in the United States, everywhere. Here in Texas, I'll give you an Celtex, beautiful brochure. Be the, it's gorgeous, making all kinds of false claims. And where do you go to get their cells? Oh, you fly to Cancun. I don't think Cancun is exactly the mecca <laughs> of cell therapy in the world. But it and is so a nice place to vacation. Yes. It's a nice place to go to the beach. <laughs> and, and so th that's a, a, a huge problem that we face in, in the sci scientific world. Now, I will say that uh, you know, Dr. Hernandez, I believe, made a comment about, well, the poor patients that have to be in these trials. Actually, it's been shown that if you participate in a uh, randomized, you know, a serious trial uh, that's, that, that's, that's being held, patients, even that are in the placebo group, 
do better than patients in the general population. Because actually, when you're, even if you're in the placebo group, you have a whole team looking over your shoulder, making sure that all your other health items and everything's okay, and really helping you out. So I would say, yes, people haven't gotten the active uh, agent, and if we knew the active agent worked, we wouldn't be doing trials, so we don't know that they, we have to prove that they work. But it is, it is a good thing to participate in clinical trials. Oh yeah, absolutely. One, one thing that I hope though is that because of what examples that you've done uh, driving the field is that like the cycle time of you know 25 years or longer uh, can get shorter because anyone who's breaking new ground is actually creating kind of like actually all the questions simultaneously that they need to answer and, um, and until people do that you don't actually have the easier predictable pathway. As cell therapies um, start advancing through clinical development and get approved, then you start having more and more predictable pathways from precedent. Uh, for example, what will the FDA need to have to understand the standard? Like what are kind of assays or tests that need to understand any off-target effects, uh, for instance, or anything like that. And so, because uh, you know, just thinking about like that cycle of 25 years uh, or more, uh, that's a really hard thing for I think anyone um, to persist in, right. but is thankful for people um, who actually have broken that new ground. <clears throat> I, I'm just gonna just, pop, I'll come back to you in just a second. Um, so I, I recognize that this is, that we should be talking about policy and things, but I think that there's a, there's a public health issue that I would like to explore with the two of you uh, for just a minute. Again, everyone that's in this room and everyone that's streaming this are, are consumers of healthcare. And we've touched a little bit on some of these clinics who are advertising, some in the United States, some outside the United States. As consumers of healthcare, what, what should we be thinking about before we venture into one of these clinics, either in the US or outside the US, uh, to make sure that we're safe? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, uh, I'll, you know, the, the medical tourism or the Mickey Mouse clinics is really um, unfortunate system. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that's a, a real challenge is that, you know, in the U.S., uh, there's a very you know, strong principle about uh, freedom of speech and, uh, which, and freedom of information. Uh, and so, uh, for consumers, uh, we have to make sure that, you know, we have this uh, concept of like, if something's too good to be true, it's probably not true. <laughs> and so how do you go to a trusted resource? Now, you know, we're uh, um, blocks away from the medical center, uh, the Texas Medical Center, the, one of the largest um, enterprises in the world about health. Like, that's, there's a lot of trusted resources there that we should be uh, using. And so I think it's really important to like, make sure to have that theme of, um, you know, yes, you can trust, but verify, and how do you verify it? Uh, through uh, known entities uh, that uh, uh, do this over and over. And I, I just really worry about um, uh, those Mickey Mouse uh, clinics because that presents false hope. Um, you know, I, I used to have this all the time where people would come uh, to Duke because uh, they heard something on a, somewhere along the line about cell therapy curing autism or something like that. Yeah. And uh, wanting to know, <coughs> why don't we have this at Duke? Uh, and, and, and then pointing to something in uh, some other part of the world saying this is happening. It's like, what's well, not true? <clears throat> I've actually had patients come to the office harmed. That's right. Uh, going outside the U.S. for some of these therapies that, again, I understand people are, I understand the hope uh, of the therapy, but I think we need to be really thoughtful about how we're consuming that, especially in clinics that maybe um, don't have a specialty in this space that are heavily advertising. I mean, there, there's some of them are out ahead of the evidence, I guess I would say. Way out. I think there needs to be greater transparency <coughs> about the standards that um, these companies, these clinics are following, um, you know, to produce these therapies, um, you know, and, and as Dr. Hernandez was saying, these claims, I mean, if, if you have, if you're making a claim, you should be able to back that up. And I think in many cases, they don't have the evidence to do so. 
Um, so as a consumer, the consumer needs to be educated to know what questions to ask. Um, and that is where I think we need to do a better job of educating the general public about the risks associated um, with some of these products. I guess, you know, one other example there, and, and this is where I've seen the harm, is that, um, you know, if, if, if someone was on a street corner and said, like, hey, like, let me inject you with this drug that's going to, like, you know, make you feel happy, <laughs> would you do that or not? <laughs> well, sure, I want to be happy. Um, but like, you know, um, exposing yourself to an injection that can cause an infection. And so there are, are a number of um, examples uh, where um, injecting so-called, uh, or re-injecting your own cells uh, actually cause harm because they cause uh, a, a deadly uh, bacterial infection because uh, none of the process was clean. And right. so, uh, or like, you know, getting some other kind of uh, virus that you don't want. So. That is so true. Um, and I've heard those claims before where if it's an autologous cell, it's being injected back into the patient, then that's completely safe. So autologous it's means it's cell. your own cell. Yes, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just, you know, sort of hyped up that way. And there are all these risks, and that's why we focus so mu much on manipulation, because the more you manipulate a product, the more you have the potential to introduce these risks, such as contamination. Um, so it, it's a very serious issue. Please. Um, so we uh, actually um, received a 351A in December of 2021 for our exosome product. And just to go back to a little bit, um, it took 10 years and $160 million so far just to get where we were actually acknowledged that we were a 351A exosome product. And now, you know, you're facing the Mickey Mouse team, and we're made here in the USA in partnership with LSU. Um, and it's, we're still facing that challenge of, there's so many Mickey Mouse companies out here that are doing it wrong. They, they're coming under 361, saying they're, they're, they're topical products, and telling doctors that you can inject this product. But it hasn't faced the scrutiny that we as a company have. Um, and you know, I think the hardest part is getting access to doctors like yourselves. And I, I don't know if there's like some way to have that transparency and you know, like talk about it on the side. Hey, here's the 351A guys that actually are a research and investigative drug. They have their IND, and you guys can use them. Um, and I think that would open up a lot of the research because still, even the research that we're doing right now involved with UT Hospital and. It's, it's going to take a year just for one joint injection with, with the exosome still. So we still have a long process to go. So I think, you know, how do we speed up that process is my question. If you're there at that 12 years now that we've had research, how do we get it across to scholars and physicians like you yourselves? So, <clears throat> again, for those who were unable to hear the question, there was a... Um, sort of a, an anecdote uh, from one of the audience members here about how difficult it has been to get a product sort of even to sort of later stage testing. Long time horizon, very expensive. And then, and then <clears throat> conflating true scientific progress with some of these um, clinics that, that are using cell and biological-based therapies without much evidence? And is, is there a mechanism so that the consumer of healthcare can understand what's real and what's not? Does FDA somehow keep a, you know, sort of a repository of that kind of information? And it, we're back to the same question about, <clears throat> I think everybody in the, in the audience is feeling frustrated with just the, the length of time developing these products, figuring out which ones actually are safe and effective, and getting them into humans. It's a challenging issue, and I feel very badly for companies like yourself that are trying to do the right thing, um, and you have all of this competition from those who aren't trying to do the right thing. Um, you know, it, it, it's very challenging, and you know, as FDA, we're, we're doing the best we can to provide information to the public. 
Um, you know, I mentioned the website about clinicaltrials.gov that lists um, those companies that have um, an IND with us, um, and hopefully that provides some transparency about those institutions that are actually working with us as to those who, who likely aren't. Um, I also mentioned some examples of enforcement actions. Um, you know, it's challenging as an agency to um, take enforcement actions on every bad player. It's just impossible, um, but hopefully by setting some of those examples, it serves as a warning to those who are not working um, under the appropriate regulations. I think you know, one other thing that um, hasn't happened and it ties to your issue is that there's large variation in terms of state health authorities in terms of how uh, they either have resources or how they actually enforce. And so it's these competing principles of you know, letting uh, physicians, you know, having freedom of practice to make choices because you know, there are patients in front of you, you have to make a choice, uh, oftentimes you have to use a judgment with what's available versus those who are bad actors who are using vulnerable patients who have a problem to generate uh, um, a large amount of money to have vacation homes around the world. <laughs> that part's not transparent. And so, but the states you know, have you know, much more direct ways for enforcing um, those bad actors who are offering um, uh, hope or actually using patients, unfortunately, to make money for themselves in that realm of state. And so I think there's, there has to be multiple um, channels to tackle this issue. FDA, state health authorities, also feel like um, uh, healthcare systems can also uh, play a role. Um, and, and if they are, if any of these folks are affiliated in any way, like how do they get squeezed out? Dr. Perrin, before I come to you, I just want to ask Dr. Hernandez one other quick question. Tell us a little bit about <clears throat> what it would look like if all of those people that were seeking clinical care from these stem cell therapy approaches entered clinical trials. Well, you know, one part is that <coughs> you know, I think that the cycle of the late stages of development would be much faster. Uh, so, like, uh, you know, the examples that have been highlighted here of, like, taking decades to get to um, ultimately uh, the stages need for approval, like, that's really intolerable. And so, if you, um, you know, right now, for example, only about 2% of the U.S. Um, who are eligible for a trial participate. And so, if you thought, you know, all the people who could, and so you just went to 10%, uh, well, that's five times faster. That's money and time that can be reinvested in this. And so I think that's, you know, how do you get to 5X, which is actually not even that large. Uh, and as noted earlier, people who participate in trials, they have a better environment that's caring for them in a way that they don't get otherwise. And so that's also a, a benefit here, yeah. so. Dr. Perrin. I, I just wanted to give a real easy, quick, and understandable example for the lay people here uh, about like a small detail in, in any of these therapies that you, d things that you take for granted. Just being a normal person, you think, oh, I'm gonna get some cells. Okay, well, you're thinking that you're getting cells that are alive, right? I mean, you, and, and what would that, we call that viability. And so we think, well, that'd be 100%. You're getting cells that work and that are alive. Well, so one of the first things that, that the FDA makes you do is actually prove like if you're putting things through a catheter, what the viability of your product is. And so in products that are FDA approved, the viability may be 85, 90%, okay? If you go to some clinic somewhere, you may be getting an injection of a bunch, it probably are, of a bunch of dead cells, okay? Now the placebo effect is huge, so, and I've seen it. And so people go, oh man, I got this injection, I just feel so much better. <laughs> and, but, just so this is one, this is one of about a hundred details, is just cell viability. So that just gives you an example of, of things that if you're just a regular person, you're not thinking about all these things, and you're being had uh, if you're really not uh, going to an institution that's really doing 
very serious work because our regulatory bodies are here for a reason and to, to make things be serious. And, and in these clinics, they're just yeah. not serious. And to take that one step further, you, you mentioned viability, that's at release. So that's you know in the injection, in the syringe. Um, but after it's injected into the patient, what is the viability of the cells? Do they persist? You know, and that requires a significant amount of work and research from these developers to really understand what's going on. And I don't know that these clinics um, who are not doing these things, you know, they're not taking that extra step. So I think we've made a strong case for participation in clinical trials so that we can develop a greater understanding, a greater body of knowledge around stem cell therapy and across all of the different domains. I, I want to, yeah, please. <clears throat> limited excess of showing people sites with degenerative nerves. Um, what can you people reflect on people who are suffering eyesight loss from eye disease? Is stem cell a hope here going forward for my wife and millions of other people that won't? So <clears throat> again, I'll just repeat the question. Uh, again, I I'm sorry for your wife and the medical challenges she's facing, but there was a question about whether or where we are in terms of regenerative cell-based therapies for neurologic conditions, uh, particularly nerve injury. And uh, Heather, you may have some knowledge or perspective on that. Adrian, you may as well. Um, yeah, well, actually, I remember um, uh, decades ago going out to California uh, with a uh, regenerative medicine company that they had some really great concepts in terms of uh, having stem cells and being uh, regenerative and, and also this idea of like how they can differentiate and potentially to uh, new tissue targets. And, um, and that was, um, you know, literally 20 years ago. Um, and unfortunately that uh, company's largely folded. And so one of the challenges we have is that uh, whether it's a neurological system, so nerve, it's not necessarily a single nerve. Uh, there are all sorts of components that have to come together. And so having that orchestra of like, um, a, a single cell type that may be pluripotent, meaning it can turn into anything, turn into the right types of cells and the right kind of architecture, how everything fits, and then also being able to, in this case, like establish, uh, uh, reestablish re vision, is an orchestra that we um, still are working out how that could really happen now. Uh, and so I think those are the, the challenges. And so, because that case you just, um, uh, described as is you know something that everyone is hoping for and so it will take a, a, a series of things that it's done and so I worry a little bit about like you know the idea that like hey someone can so-called do uh, regenerative medicine not knowing that like to to all the different steps that uh, have to bring the different types of, or create the different types of cells in the right architecture the right connections uh, that's still a lot to do uh, so far. But what universities in the U.S. are is something that you've contacted to, to her to explore? Uh, well, there are a number of places that, in your case, you know, are focusing on um, eye disease and uh, uh, doing that. And so, like, I think if you were to go through and look at some of the top eye centers, um, they probably have different types of research programs. It may not necessarily be. Uh, so-called regenerative therapy, but I think it's partly to look for what are things to uh, establish uh, better vision. Yeah. Is it a long-term hope for people who have lost eyesight with optic nerve damage? Uh, that, is that there? Uh, you know, everything is so-called on the horizon. It's just we don't always know how far the horizon is. Yeah, the neuro neurological space is, is a very complex issue. Um, we just had an advisory committee, some of you may be aware of, um, this week on an indication for ALS. And it's, you know, it's a very complex 
um, you know, mechanism of action and is not always well understood. And there are a lot of questions that this committee was asking for this particular indication. Um, and there were a lot of great presentations about the cells being in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, it, it is very complex, but, and, and I'm very sorry for your situation. My, my heart goes out to you. Um, you know, there, there are avenues aside from an approved product to get access to some of these therapies. Um, you know, there are situations for expanded access and certain emergency situations for patients that need these things. So I encourage you to, to search out for something if you find that that's helpful. The, the tricky part, and I think your question kind of gets back to the hope that we all have for cell-based therapies, and the hope is that it works. And I'm still not sure that we have the data to understand whether a cell-based approach to regenerate an optic nerve is the right answer to the problem. I want to just, uh, we, we're running short on time. <clears throat> I want both and of you. There's a question up right here. Oh, so sorry. Oh, two questions. Thanks. Great question. So the question is, how does one get involved in a, in a trial? What's the easiest way to understand what's available? Yeah, well, you know, the Texas Medical Center has like a, a number of great institutions that have clinical trials all the time. And so I think that's, you know, one, it depends on what someone's health problem people are interested in um, participating. So, and that's the first step is like, you know, uh, if someone has a health problem and that's the aim, then finding the clinical trials that are offered across the, these different institutions for those health problems, and there are um, a lot of those. There's also, um, and this is where, again, making sure to use um, trusted sources, uh, there are also online kind of trial matching um, capabilities for different organizations. And so when people have a question, um, they can enter in that and then be able to find like, are there trials near them, uh, for instance? Um, and then, but again, like encouraging people to use um, places that are, are trusted, that you know, uh, you have your um, clinical, uh, that you would get your clinical care uh, for uh, here is really important because there are also these, I'll just call uh, trial machineries that like are just gonna sign you up for something and uh, take the money and go. And so you have to have the consumer beware approach to your here. And Heather, maybe you could speak to the clinicaltrials.gov site, which I think mm -hmm. is a pretty reliable source. That's right, that's where you have a <coughs> list of information about the clinical trials that are ongoing. So you could contact those um, people who are responsible for those trials and seek that. Yes, ma'am. The question is really around <clears throat> stem cell transplantation for different kinds of malignancies, and what do we know about, yeah. about that? Well, full disclosure, <coughs> I, I'm not an oncologist or a cancer doc. I do know them, and, <laughs> I, and even the other week I flew next to one, so I was uh, learning a lot about what's happening there. But oncology is actually um, just an incredible area that's really expanded in terms of, uh, in terms of therapies and also like cellular-based or stem cell therapies um, that can uh, treat different types of cancers. And there are different types of well, cell. Just for myeloma. Yeah, and so that's an example of success. Now, one of the things that we are hoping for, um, and we're starting to see success in this, is that um, uh, if you go decade by decade, what patients who said if they had like some type of um, leukemia or lymphoma or multiple myeloma, like to get a stem cell transplant or treatment, they would have to go through lots of really um, difficult stages uh, of therapy to get there. Um, and, so, and so those now are more and more advancing, so like people are able to tolerate 
uh, more easily uh, these types of uh, stem cell uh, therapies or transplants. So again, you know, this is where the advances of understanding what's happening and then understanding like how cell therapies can fit uh, with individuals. And I think the other issue that, that your question raises and I think your response highlights is <clears throat> We, we haven't even talked about comparative effectiveness mm -hmm. kinds of trials, but there are all kinds of new therapies that are coming out for malignancies in particular where we're, oncologists have found very clever ways to activate your own immune system to try to attack a cell. So the question, nec the next question will be, what's better, a stem cell transplant or an immunotherapy based approach? So I think that we'll continue to refine this knowledge, but the number of questions is, is, is immeasurably long. And again, I'm gonna just highlight, I think it's the sort of the mandate for us to continue to participate in clinical trials so we can answer the questions. And, and then there's um, therapies uh, that are, again, advancing uh, CAR T cell therapy, which is, again, cellular based, which um, is very um, interesting in terms of how that can be used uh, for different types of cancers. Uh, so, yeah. and also expanding outside potentially, but again, uh, you know, doing things outside of someone's body and then be able to inject cells that are programmed in a way to take care of a cancer. So I've got one more provocative question. We have two minutes left, so I'm gonna let each of you talk for <laughs> one minute. <laughs> so one of the questions that had come up is, how is AI gonna change this? <laughs> what, <laughs> but you only have a minute. <laughs> well, I, I'll just use, uh, you know, I showed, you know, this example of like 21 million articles that are out there. Now, like, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are voracious readers here and say you cover <laughs> 21 million articles out there every year. Uh, that's impossible to do. And so um, AI, um, just to understand like the world's literature as it's growing, um, is something uh, that can be very... Uh, relevant here, and so that just part. The other end of the spectrum is in, you know, what happens in terms of, um, say, as cell therapies are developing, that orchestra that I mentioned. Uh, so we think of a cell as like, you know, this single unit. Well, it's actually a bag of molecules. <laughs> and so like, how are they interacting simultaneously? And so now you can apply AI to understand like at a single cell level, like what are all the interactions that are happening inside uh, that cell? And so that's you know really incredible. And there are companies that are actually are developing that so that we're smarter before taking something forward into the next stage. So you don't go through 10 years and $160 million, for example, and not know exactly what's gonna potentially happen. You know, that you have some vision of what the orchestra is. And Dr. Lombardi, from your perspective as a regulator, how do you see AI playing into this to, to, to expedite an understanding of safety and efficacy? Yeah, I think AI presents a unique opportunity to better understand the data, as Dr. Hernandez was mentioning, identifying trends, um, identifying important you know, mechanisms of action or scientific areas, um, understanding about the cells, um, that helps us from a regulatory perspective. And then on the manufacturing side, implementing AI through things like, um, you know, advanced manufacturing, where you're, you know, putting inline tests into the manufacturing process, where you're looking at multiple aspects of a cell and you're using the output from those tests from an AI perspective to better understand the product that's coming out. Um, so I think it could potentially be game-changing, and I, and I think it's something that we're all excited about. Well, we've run up to 9.30. <clears throat> Dr. Hernandez, Dr. Lombardi, thank you so much for coming today to, to give the, the talks and then for this really great discussion. And I want to thank everybody who's been in the audience, Dr. Perrin. You're <laughs> let, let me just finish. I don't want to be Debbie Downer, because, you know, I made a lot of <clears throat> yeah. circumspect comments, but we do understand mechanisms in certain cells now. Big Pharma is getting involved in stem cell therapy. We are going to be using embryonic cells, we're gonna be using induced pluripotent cells, which are like cells that go in a time machine to become something else. And we're gonna use the cells that we already know and understand better. And this is going to work. 
and I would say in less than 10 years, we will have approved cell therapies for things. So I don't want people to leave the impression like, oh my God, it's all doom and gloom. No, the future is bright and the future of medicine goes through regenerative medicine and it will change the world. Thanks, Emerson. <laughs> so to all of you, thank you very much for coming. It's been a great conversation. To those of you who have joined us um, through the streaming uh, platform, thanks for joining and we appreciate you coming.